Yes, thank you very much. So it's uh, pl my pleasure uh, to open the first session. And uh, I've just learned that there in the first session we'll have around about 250 slides. No, I'm just kidding. So we don't want to waste any time now just moving into slides and into the presentations. And I'm just hand over to my colleague Yasmin because she's very much more involved into the Ewing topic than I am. So Yasmin, please take over and we we'll start our first session. Thank you, Marcus. Um, yeah, it is a great uh, honor for me to be selected to announce the following speakers here today. They each represent um, a legend in the context of research um, into Ewing sarcoma. They have a considerable share in the significantly improved chances of survival of the sick, mostly very young patients. So I am very excited and curious also what they are going to talk about. Go ahead. Okay, I believe I go first. I'm Paul Myers from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, and I'm gonna share my screen with you. And any day now. My responsibility is to talk a little bit about James Ewing and also the history of the development of treatment of Ewing sarcoma in, in North America. This is a picture of the memorial of the, of the New York Cancer Hospital in the first <laughs> third of the 20th century shown on the left. On the right, you see our current facility. That building was built with huge high ceilings to admit lots of air because it was thought that that would improve the care of patients with cancer. This is the timeline for James Ewing. In 1899, he was appointed the first professor of clinical pathology at the newly formed Medical College of Cornell University. In 1907, he was a founding member of the American Association of Cancer Research. In 1913, he was a founding member of what became the American Cancer Society. In 1919, he published his first edition of Neoplastic Diseases, a textbook of tumors. And in 1921, exactly 100 years ago, he published what is now the classic paper defining diffuse endothelioma of bone, which we'll talk about. In 1931, he was named the president of the medical board of the General Memorial Hospital for the Treatment of Cancer and Allied Diseases. So how did he discover the tumor which bears his name? In the first part of the 20th century, the divisions we recognize among medical specialties were far more fluid. James Ewing was the chair of pathology, but he also administered radiation treatment. The only form of radiation which was available was radium, discovered by Marie Curie, for which she received the Nobel Prize with her husband in 1911. Ewing and others had early on recognized that bone tumors were highly resistant to radiation therapy. In 1918, a 14-year-old girl was admitted with the tumor of the humerus, and it was diagnosed as osteogenic sarcoma. A radium pack was applied to the arm. The tumor began to shrink immediately, and in five weeks, no swelling remained. He went on to identify six other cases of a similar presentation, aged 14 to 19. And in his paper, there's a quote that says, radiographs gave characteristic features on which a diagnosis may be based with considerable certainty. Pretty good for, 90, for, for, for 100 years ago. On the left-hand side here, you can see a picture of a classic CT scan of a pelvic tumor, which represents a Ewing sarcoma. And on the right, the appearance under the microscope of the small round blue cells without differentiation arranged in sheets. In his paper, Dr. Ewing described that tissue was examined microscopically showing broad sheets of small polyhedral cells with pale cytoplasm, small hyperchromatic nuclei, well-defined cell borders, and complete absence of intracellular material. Again, quoting from his paper, early rarefaction of the bone indicates that the disease begins in the blood vessels of the bone tissue. Fascinating observation from 100 years ago. And he went on to say the designation of the tumor as endothelioma rather than as myeloma seems advisable since myeloma is properly reserved for tumors derived from the specific cells of the bone marrow. And for this and many other accomplishments, as we've already seen, he was recognized on the cover of Time magazine in 1931. 
Now I'm gonna to switch to talking about the early days of treatment in North America. And back in the 1960s, single agent chemotherapy was reported to show activity in Ewing sarcoma. One of the first papers from Watt Sutow in 1962 reported responses to cyclophosphamide. In a similar paper, two years later, Holcomb reported seven of 13 patients responded to cyclophosphamide. In 1967, from Memorial Sloan Kettering, there was a report that dactinomycin was active in the treatment of Ewing sarcoma. And in a rather audacious title, they included the word curability. In 1974, a very important paper published by Jerry Rosen talked about the use of multi-agent chemotherapy. And in that paper, he reported that 13 of 14 patients were alive and free of disease two years from diagnosis. Early on, it became obvious to the investigators in North America that the rarity of this disease would require cooperation. At that time, for those of you who are too young to remember, there were actually two pediatric cooperative groups in the United States that went on to merge to become what we now know as the Children's Oncology Group. But there was a recognition for the necessity for intergroup cooperation, <clears throat> which led to the formation of intergroup studies in Wilms tumor, rhabdomyosarcoma, and Ewing sarcoma. The first intergroup Ewing sarcoma, which was chaired by Mark Nesbitt, included representation from the Children's Cancer Study Group, SWOG, CALGB. It ran for three years, enrolled 342 eligible patients. All patients received radiation therapy to the primary tumor. At this time, that was the only method of local control for Ewing sarcoma. And patients <clears throat> were selected, it was not a true randomization, to receive one of three treatments. One was in Christine, dactinomycin cyclophosphamide with doxorubicin. Treatment two was the same three agents without doxorubicin. And treatment three was the same three agents with addition of whole lung radiation therapy. It's important to stop for a minute and remind you that this is the, these are the only data we have ever achieved to demonstrate the role of whole lung radiation therapy in the treatment of Ewing sarcoma. And this was a patient population that had localized Ewing sarcoma, not sarcoma metastatic to lung. And we have extrapolated from these data to our current consensus practice of administering whole lung radiation therapy following systemic chemotherapy to patients who present with lung metastases. These are the results, the five-year relapse-free survival from the intergroup Ewing sarcoma study one. And you can see that the addition of doxorubicin made a very striking improvement in the outcome achieving a five-year relapse-free survival of 60%, not as good as we achieve today, but quite respectable. The three drugs, vincristine, dactinomycin, and cyclophosphamide by themselves were inferior, but the addition of whole lung radiation therapy significantly improved outcome. We went on to carry out intergroup Ewing sarcoma study two, same three groups participating. This study ran for four years, 214 eligible patients. In this study, it was limited to patients who had localized Ewing sarcoma without pelvic primaries, and it compared a strategy of higher dose intermittent therapy to moderate dose continuous therapy. These are the treatment schemas, and you can see the treatment one. Worth noting that in this era, treatment extended far longer than we currently administer treatment. These treatments were for 78 weeks or 76 weeks, much longer than our current treatment administration. Treatment one involved vincristine, doxorubicin, and cyclophosphamide given in higher doses intermittently, and treatment two was lower doses given continuously. And you can see that the higher dose intermittent schedule achieved a significantly better five-year disease-free survival. It looks pretty good, but remember they had excluded pelvic primary patients. I think the next most important study is the study that was chaired by Holcomb Greer through the Children's Oncology Group, but once again, an intergroup study. It asked whether the addition of ifosfamide and etoposide to the other five agents which had become customary in the treatment of Ewing sarcoma would improve outcome. You all know the answer. This was the randomized prospective trial. Four agents in the standard arm, the addition of ifosfamide and etoposide in the experimental arm, and a statistically significant improvement in outcome with the addition of ifosfamide and etoposide. I think the next study that bears mentioning is a study that was carried out by the Children's Oncology Group and chaired by Rick Womer. 
And this was a study that asked in a prospective randomized fashion what the role would be for intensifying systemic chemotherapy. This particular study chose to do that by shortening the interval between chemotherapy cycles. This study ran between 2001 and 2005, enrolled 587 patients, and 568 eligible patients were used for the analysis. This study included identical doses and total cumulative doses of five chemotherapy agents with cycles of vincristine, doxorubicin, and cyclophosphamide, alternating with cycles of ifosfamide and etoposide. In the standard arm, cycles were planned for administration at three-week intervals. In the experimental arm, cycles were planned for administration at two-week intervals. And the study showed a statistically significant improvement in outcome when chemotherapy was administered with the more intensive regimen. And this has led to uh, the important studies that we'll hear about in the next group of speakers, but I believe it's my turn to, to, to turn over the stage to Dr. to Professor Alan Kraft. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. I'm a dinosaur. I'm the oldest of the three of us, so I can't move my own slides. So somebody's going to do it for me. Could you move the slides on, please? Yeah, me, but my history. In November 1972, in prehistoric times, I was a newly qualified doctor in Newcastle, a pediatrician, when we had a patient came into the ward, a 10-year-old boy with a painless mass over his right scapula. It was biopsied and shown to be a Ewing sarcoma. He was treated uh, by the radiotherapist with radiotherapy, very good local response, subsequently relapsed and died. And this is very similar to the first Ewing's patient, uh, showing that radiotherapy was good for local control, but it was no good for systemic control. Next slide, please. What was it like in 1972 in Newcastle? There was no pediatric oncology. There was leukemia, who, which was treated by general pediatricians and hematologists, and bone tumors were treated by orthopedic surgeons and occasionally by radiotherapists. There was a recognition that Newcastle needed to up its game and they needed to have somewhere to take an interest in pediatric oncology. So I was sent off to London for a year of training. Next one, please. Whilst I was at the Royal Marsden, um, there was a meeting of people from nine different centres around the UK, um, which formed the United Kingdom Children's Cancer Study Group. Um, I was still a trainee at this time, and during that meeting, um, the major diseases, there was a list of major diseases and a list of the major people at the meeting, and they went down. Judith Chessels was given leukemia, Jim Malpass was given uh, neuroblastoma, and they got to number nine on the list, which was bone tumours, and they got to number nine on the, uh, the people there, and they said to me, they said, have you ever seen a bone tumour? I said, oh, yes, I've seen a bone tumour. Right, well, you can do bone tumours. And in essence, what they wanted was somebody to take a national lead on treating the particular disease, somebody to liaise with people around the world and to try and coordinate things. So having seen one case, that was my job. It's interesting that when Jerry Rosen came to Memorial from NCI, uh, he was going to be a biochemist, um, but by the time he got there, they'd scrapped the biochemical job. So he was asked by the head of Sloan Kettering, what do you want to do? He said, well, what have you got available? They said bone tumours or miscellaneous. So he took bone tumours. So the two of us you know, were bone tumour people purely by chance. Next one, please. Um, so first thing I had to do was to find out what Ewing's tumour was all about. And Paul has already mentioned the study, the intergroup study led by Mark Nesbitt. He's shown you the results. Um, and it was quite clear that there was chemotherapy, which was going to be of value. So 
my first job was to set up a national protocol of treatment for Ewing sarcoma in the UK. Next one. So uh, ET1, uh, patients under 40 with Ewing sarcoma, a non-randomized study treated with the same drugs that had been used in the intergroup study, local treatment with surgery and or radiotherapy. And over a period of eight years, we managed to find 142 patients. Survival uh, for those without metastases was 30%, 8% for metastatic disease. And that was published as you see. The next one, please. But what was it like then during those early years? Well, first of all, we had no patients. We had to find them. We had to get them from the radiotherapists and from the orthopedic surgeons. We had no facilities. We had a general pediatric ward. Um, and for all you young people, you may wonder how we cope with no CT scan, no MRI or any of the other fancy things. The other thing that we didn't have is we didn't have any, any good supportive care. We used metoclopramide or Stematil for an antiemetic. There was no ondansetron, very poor antibiotics. And our patients often got really seriously sick. They would vomit uh, throughout their treatment and they got to the stage where they wouldn't come into hospital because they didn't want to vomit. Clearly, that's all changed now. And Ansetron was a revolution for us. We didn't have any money uh, apart from the patient care costs. There was no trial infrastructure. And then the really positive thing was that we didn't have any ethics committees. We didn't have trial sponsors um, and we didn't have any bureaucracy. Wouldn't you like to go back to those days? Um, all of those things are very good, particularly from the patient point of view but it was much easier working in those days. The other thing was that we managed to open ET1 within six months of thinking about it. How many of our modern trials open within six months? But they're better trials. Next one. So we moved on to ET2, which again was following the international pattern of uh, substituting isophosphamide for cyclophosphamide. Next one. Um, that ran from 87 to 93, a lot more patients in this one, still a non-randomized study, um, but our five-year survival had gone off, gone up to 62%. We were really heartened by that, a really positive result. The next one. And these are just the figures taken from the UK CCSG registers of the improved survival um, in five-year periods. Next one. Now, the important thing is that Kraft met Jürgens, and it was love at first sight. We realized we had to get together. We realized we had to work together. The next one. Because we'd actually been doing virtually the same thing in the UK as they had been doing in Germany. Neither of us had enough patients to do any randomized studies, but we were doing the same thing. So clearly there was a need for us to get together, um, which is what we did. The next one, next. Um, we got together to form KESS, which became ICAS. And these are some of the players in that. Um, and before I hand over to Herbert, one of the most important things, and I think a message for the young people today is the friends that you make in your career are very important. They cement your work together. And Herbert and I have become very close friends. We visited each other. We know each other's families. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's a very important side effect of the professional work that, that we do together. So over to my, uh, I was going to say, I better not say, uh, over to Herbert. Thank you very much. 
my honor to continue this journey through time and through 100 years of Ewing sarcoma with part three. Our hero at the time in the late 70s was Jared Rosen from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and his publication in 1976, where he described durable responses and even cures, even cure with uh, patients of Ewing sarcoma. This is the first trial he published, T2 was it called, with a sequential application of actinomycin D, adiamycin, being Christine, and cyclophosphamide. I had the privilege of working with him for one year, 78, 79. And when I returned back to Germany, I was asked to organize Ewing sarcoma trials within GPOH, the German Society of Pediatric Oncology and Hematology. And here is a list of the series of the, series of the four initial uh, consecutive trials, 81, 86, 92, and 99. It's more or less very similar to Jerry Rosen's attempts. The 81 study, all patients received the same treatment with Christian actinomycin D, cyclophosphamide, and adiamycin for 12 courses uh, for 36 weeks. In 86, for the first time, we learned that we should uh, stratify patients according to risk groups, standard risk and high risk. And we introduce ifosamide in what was called what we defined as high risk patient, which is defined as burden by burden of tumor and of course metastatic disease. In 92, we started with the first randomized attempts, uh, increasing chemotherapy intensity from trial to trial and adding other agents. What did we meet? What did we mean by increasing drug intensity at the time? There's not much room for increasing in Christine. There isn't much room for increasing actinomycin D. The increase in treatment intensity we meant at the time was an increase in alkylating agents, mainly through the switch from conventionally dosed cyclophosphamide uh, with a total of 12 to 14 grams cumulative dose to high doses of iphosphamide by adding more uh, alkylating uh, activity and the cumulative dose of iphosphamide was between 70 and 100 grams. And finally, by adding a fifth drug, uh, atroposide uh, to the scenario. Uh, and there wasn't, we, we would have liked to increase drug intensity with anticyclines, but there was, we soon learned about the hazard and the risk of cardiomyopathy. So the cumulative dose of doxorubicin was lowered rather than further increased. This is the series of the four uh, initiating the evolution of the uh, of the four initial of the four, four initial trials, you see how the number of patients recruited increased from trial to trial. 184 in the first trial from Germany, 490 with more participants, with more institutions participating, and also medical oncology clinics joining in. 490. Then we got we married. Anne and I got uh, married and worked together. 875 patients uh, with the ICAS 92 trial. And then finally, more, more and more groups in Europe joined and also transatlantic with the EE 99 trial with an accrual of over 3,000 patients in the given time. What we learned is that what we related to increased chemotherapy intensity the three-year disease-free survival increased from trial to trial, starting with 56% at three years to over 70%. With the 99 study, we entered the randomization phases. We defined standard risk both by volume and by response to chemotherapy because more and more patients underwent surgery and we had learned the impact of response from osteosarcoma uh, trials. So it is good response and uh, small tumors defined as below 200 ml tumor volume. 
These patients were randomized for VAC versus Y. Uh, ifosamide in maintenance following intense induction with vincristin, ifosamide, doxorubicin, and etoposide. In R2, which were high risk patients, either patients with poor response, large tumors, and no surgery, or patients with lung metastasis, there was a randomization as suggested by our French friends and colleagues when uh, the intensity of alkylating agents was of such importance and such value, we randomized a conventional vincristine, actinomycin, and phosphamide maintenance uh, to high-dose chemotherapy with busophan mefilan regime and autologous uh, stem cell rescue. And R3 were patients with disseminated disease. So what did we learn? The first randomization in standard risk patients, do we, after intense induction, need ifosamide in maintenance, or can we do with conventional doocyclophosphamide? There was no difference in favor of ifosamide. Uh, so uh, this was a trial that we don't need intense to the very, very intense chemotherapy to the very, very end. Now let's look at the second randomization with. Uh, uh, either conventional maintenance compared to busophon mefalon based high dose uh, chemotherapy. There were two subgroups in R2. The first subgroup uh, were patients uh, with uh, either large tumors when ir irradiated or uh, patients with a poor response to chemotherapy, randomized conventional maintenance against busophon mefalon high dose chemotherapy. And uh, in both in disease-free survival and overall survival, there was an advantage of the Bujo von Melfalon arm compared to the conventional maintenance arm. In the second group of high-risk patients with lung metastasis, the comparison was not high-dose chemotherapy con versus conventional chemotherapy, but whole lung irradiation was considered standard of care at this time. So the comparison was conventional maintenance chemotherapy with whole lung irradiation compared to Buzol van Mevelan. We didn't dare to add whole lung irradiation because we felt this is not compatible <laughs> with Buzol van uh, Mevelan hydrose chemotherapy due to uh, the hazard of lung toxicity. In these patients, again, high-dose chemotherapy versus chemotherapy plus whole lung irradiation, there was no longer a significant advantage for busulfan melfan high-dose chemotherapy as compared to conventional maintenance. So in summary, standard of care enduring sarcoma is systemic combination chemotherapy as intense as possible, especially uh, with respect to alkylating agents for approximately one year, 10 months to one year, under cyclings, alkylating agents, linka, topoisomers inhibitors, and local therapy. And this meant either surgery, radiotherapy, or surgery plus radiotherapy. So important is to look at what did we learn with respect to risk factors of disease for survival. The first risk factor is metastasis at the time of diagnosis. Most patients present with localized disease, 75% in our studies. 25% have lung meta have metastasis at diagnosis, either lung only, 13%, bone, bone marrow, 7%, or bone, bone marrow and lung metastasis, or other rare locations like lymph node metastasis. And, so on. and there's a clear uh, advantage of localized disease uh, compared to patients with lung metastasis, and even more so compared to patients with uh, bone metastasis that disseminated the skeletal disease at the time of diagnosis. Next, we, we had learned from osteosarcoma treatment how important is good response to, to upfront chemotherapy. And as more and more patients with Ewing sarcoma also underwent surgery for local control, we were able to study the impact of histological response. And as you see here, also in Ewing sarcoma, histologic response to upfront chemotherapy is of great prognostic value in Ewing sarcoma. 
less than 10% viable cells at the time of surgery do much better compared to patients with more than 10% viable tumors at the time of surgery. And histological response, as, as we felt as a result of more intense chemotherapy, increased from 66% in the first trial to 76% uh, in the next trial, in the, in the latest trial, the E19 study. The next question was, what about local therapy? We all knew that you cannot cure a patient without local therapy, but is given the radius sensitivity to uh, of viewing sarcoma, is radiation equivalent to surgical local control? If you look at if you if you look at the analysis, surgery alone and the combination of surgery and irradiation do better compared to radiation alone. Uh, this is not so in patients with small tumors, less than 200 ml tumor volume, but this is very much so in patients with large tumors. Why is it? Because in the radiation cohort, there is a larger proportion of patients with local recurrences or combined local and uh, systemic recurrences compared to the surgical cohort or the cohort of, of surgery and irradiation. So the next question is, do all need patients who have surgery for local control need radiation afterwards? This is a multivariate analysis of our French colleagues, and they see a clear advantage for post-operative radiation. So this is then a, a risk-benefit evaluation. Does every patient need it? This depends on age, this depends on tumor size, this depends on the initial soft tissue mass and response to chemotherapy and so on. And that's why we need intense discussions in the sequence of um, tumor boards uh, where we have to discuss between all disciplines what is the best treatment for each individual patient. So risk factors, dissemination, tumor volume, histological response, and local therapy. Next and finally, does a patient with recurrent disease enduring sarcoma have a second chance? Most recurrences occur within two years from initial diagnosis, nearly 90% within three years from diagnosis, and 95% within five years from the initial diagnosis, and only rarely there are later recurrences in your sarcoma. Survival after relapse is extremely poor, so it's in summary, patients with during sarcoma have one chance to be cured this is after first presentation. After one year, survival is 42%. After three years, 17%. And after five and 10 years, it's only 11 or 9% respectively. The only positive impact has time to recurrence. The few patients with late recurrences fare better compared to patients with the usual metastatic presentation or recurrence metastation within two manifestation within two years from diagnosis. So what would James Ewing say to us now? There's no cure with radiation alone. There's no cure with surgery alone. There's no cure with chemotherapy alone, but cure is now possible with combined modality treatment in the majority of patients. What else would he say to us? Intensive chemotherapy is essential. Combined local treatment is preferable and should be considered treatment of choice. And what we need are new agents, new targets, new modalities, new ideas. And this is the challenge for the next generation of viewing sarcoma researchers. Uh, and in the end, I hope, I hope I've kept in time more or less. We wish on behalf of Ed Kraft, my partner in European trials, to all the contributors and all our good friends uh, we met and unfortunately, we cannot meet again in person today, but I hope we can do this in the near future. Thank you very much. I hand over to the chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe Yasmin, you want to want to comment, but maybe first, uh, thank you very much. That was really a great pleasure and an honor to 
listen to these presentations, to this this fantastic journey. I think uh, through around about fifty years and. Uh, Thank you again for your uh, really incredible work uh, that you have done during the last years um, individually, but also, as you mentioned, as a team. So as, as researchers, as pioneers, as drivers, but also as, as carers for our patients. So, so thank you very much for this. Um, and I like very much the, the statement of uh, Professor Kraft that uh, he gave something like a message to the, to, to the next generation about um, uh, friendship and, 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 and really working close together with other colleagues. Maybe po uh, Professor Myers or Professor Jürgens, do you want to add something like a message or a comment to uh, young doctors or maybe also to patients or patient advocates? I could not agree more with Professor Kraft and with Professor Jürgens that the collaboration with my colleagues around the world has been indispensable to the progress of, of the treatment of this disease and has been the joy of my life to get to know the, my, my colleagues who, who labor in the same field that I do. And it is a benefit and a pleasure that accrues to those of us who labor in this very difficult field. Well, it's not easy to set up a trial nowadays under the re regulatory overhead, but it's very, very important. We have to move in new ideas first line and please, be patient and uh, do not run away from the overregulation in, in our world and add to a further improvement with new ideas, new substances, uh, because also when we are nearly 80%, there's still 20% of patients to go who do not have a chance uh, surviving during sarcoma at this time. So this is the challenge for the future. 90%, 95%, 98%. There will never be 100%, but we have to, we have to reach over 90%. So Please thank do. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, uh, for the uh, presentation and also for these statements. Yasmin, do you want to add something? Yes, of course, I, I would huh? like to. It was a pleasure to listen to all three of you and you're not only dinosaurs <laughs> or something like that. I am absolutely impressed. Um, this was a lecture of collaboration and uh, of working together. And uh, I think uh, this is um, a really ultimate uh, challenge of treating you in sarcoma nowadays um, to collaborate and to share data and to work together all over the world. And um, yeah, thank you very, very much. Thank so, you for listening to us. <laughs>